Okay. I'll like to request uh, uh, Ashish now uh, to join us. Ashish also. Um, back in the early 80s, uh, when Ashish, uh, late 70s, when Ashish and many others uh, were students in Delhi University, they formed a, a group called uh, Culturate and started working on environmental issues. That was also the time when this um, discussion around non-party political formation was given by Professor Rajini Kothari, which some of you uh, must have also read. Um, and, you know, a lot of environmental NGOs uh, started coming up um, right from uh, that period. Ashish has been with Culturate since then and has taken the work forward um, and has uh, basically mo worked more on conservation and livelihood issues um, and on um, uh, rights issues also. He has been in the committee of various uh, um, formed by the uh, government, government of India and also been in the board of various organizations like IUC and um, such and uh, it continues to inspire us um, till now um, and uh, so he'll talk about his own experience on biodiversity on, and conservation and others. Well, I think a little beyond. <laughs> okay, thanks Praveen and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, it's hard going after joy because like water, his stocks flow very nicely. <laughs> uh, mine will not, so. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'll try. It's a um, well. It's a pleasure to be here. Actually, for many reasons. One is it's always great to be with students. Uh, but secondly, also this used to be my. Uh, I was in civil lines for thirty years, so Kashmiri Gate was one of my haunts. It of course looked very different at that point in time, but still there are some areas that one can recognize. So it's nice to be back. Um, let me start with actually, you know, a context of what's happening right now and then try and bring bring it back uh, a little later, which is the incident with Sony Sori, which I think you would all uh, have heard of, the attack on her uh, and she's struggling in a hospital in Delhi now. Um, and more broadly, what's happening in Chhattisgarh with regard to the attacks on uh, Adivasis, Adivasi rights, human rights, and uh, on those who are trying to support Adivasis who are struggling for their land rights or forest rights and so on, including this the group of very uh, brave group of uh, women lawyers who have been trying over the last few years to do something there and have recently been hounded out by the police. Um, I think what this incident, unfortunately a lot of the discussion around it has not yet made the linkages but I think it's really crucial that we make the linkages between what's happening in terms of the human rights violations there and uh, ecological and development issues because they are very closely linked. And uh, to make that link, uh, let me go back to some of my earliest learnings in the ecological field, ecological and development field, which was back in 1979 and 80, we actually, 80 and 81, we did uh, a series of treks. This is when we were either in school or uh, in college. A series of treks through the Garhwal region in the Himalaya. Uh, partly because we like trekking and of course the Himalaya is a great place for trekking. But also we were very curious to know more about this movement we would heard of called the Chitko movement. You all heard of it? Yes. Anybody who is not? Uh, incidentally, anything I say which you do not understand or any term I use, please just shout, okay? Don't wait till the end to ask questions and if there's because this happened to me when I was on that side of the room. People, would, teachers would say things and I would simply not understand and they would just go rattling on and not stop. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if you don't know about Chipko, just say so because I'm happy to explain. But everybody knows the Chipko movement, the tree hugging movement, where actually apparently never nobody ever actually hugged a tree, <laughs> but uh, it, they threatened to, and, and a lot of timber felling was stopped. Uh, I mean that's a very short capsule of a long movement. But we, when we did these treks through the area, um, just trying to understand the movement, we uh, went to many villages and stayed with the people there. And what, one of the interesting things that came out of that was two interesting things. One, that it wasn't simply a matter of trying to save some trees, because people like trees. 
but it was a, matter, a fundamental matter of, of livelihoods, of water security, of food security, uh, and so on. Uh, but also, secondly, that uh, there was an interesting gender perspective there because most of the actions on the ground were actually by women, who were the ones who relate much more closely to the forest and the land. Uh, whereas the news coming out into places like New Delhi were, was about people like Sundaral Bhavanath and uh, Chandi Prasad Bhatji, who were men. Not that they did. Uh, didn't do a lot of work. They did, of course. There was a lot of very interesting actions that they took, and, and of course, they took the message across to the world. But the ground level struggles by the women were kind of not focused on so much in the outside world. So this was an interesting you know, uh, sort of uh, learning for us. But uh, let's focus a little bit on how they were challenging uh, not just the timber felling, but they were actually challenging also. Uh, the model of development that was being imposed, of which timber felling was one, uh, one sort of manifestation, right? Uh, and the earliest actions, in fact, were against timber felling by a sports good manufacturer, cricket bat manufacturer, in fact. So uh, this was kind of for us early exposure to people asking questions about development itself. It was not just about saving a few trees and tigers and things like that. The second uh, early exposure for us on that was 1983 when we did a long trek along the Narmada uh, river. Interestingly enough, under a scheme of the government of India, the Ministry of Sport, Department of Sports called the Promotion of Adventure Scheme. So we actually got some funding from that and we walked quite a bit of the length of the river, walked, boated, bust uh, along the entire length of the river. And uh, part of it was again just to have fun. But part was also to try and understand uh, what was going to happen if a project that we would heard of at that point of time, the Narmada Valley Development Project, which is 30 large dams coming up, coming up in the valley, what would that do to the valley, to the ecosystems, environment and people. And uh, of course, we were all uh, complete amateurs and we, we are not professional researchers, nothing. But you know, just our understanding of what was going to happen, we produced as a report in 1984. And for some reason, I still don't know exactly why, but it kind of became a little bit more popular and people thought it was a really good report against uh, on, on issues of dams. When I look back at it, I'm not so sure anymore. Uh, it was kind of amateurish. But anyway, we were asking these questions and again, the same question came to us saying, okay, this is not just about one dam coming up somewhere and submerging forests and displacing people. It is, of course, that, but it's also questioning uh, the mode of development itself because it represented a particular model of development which Joyce mentioned, which is about industrialization, large scale infrastructure, GDP, economic growth, mm -hmm. per capita income, etc. There's a whole you know, uh, structure or framework of development that's been built up which we all kind of have been uh, brainwashed into thinking that that's the only way to go. And for us, these, uh, it became uh, questioned through the eyes of those who were uh, saying that they don't want to move out of their homes or through the eyes of people who were beginning to question uh, the, the dams and you know what it meant, the cultural impacts, people were saying you know Narmada river should not be shackled at all, no river should be shackled. So even looking at it from these different perspectives. But interestingly enough at that time we were also part uh, of or sort of involved with discussions on what we later, a little bit later realized was a rather narrow brand of environmentalism. Okay? So uh, we, I myself for instance got into interested in all of this through uh, wildlife. Right? I just like being out in wilderness and you know, uh, being part of being in nature and things like that and also animal rights. And uh, it was over a few years of that, of that involvement that I realized and not just I but a number of colleagues realized that the vision of wildlife conservation that actually had been uh, implemented in India through policies and programs like Project Tiger was rather narrow because essentially it talked about only nature and excluded human beings from that. So uh, to me uh, and to a lot of us working at that point in time sort of the realization and especially this realization came when we, when there was a horrible incident of six, seven people being killed in Bharatpur National Park in Rajasthan when they tried to enter the park with their buffaloes and they were shot at and seven of them were killed and we did an investigation there which is kind of one of the incidents which really opened up our eyes and said that there's something wrong with a model of conservation which tries to separate people from nature and especially people who are dependent on their survival and livelihoods 
on the nature and natural resources of the area. Unfortunately, you see that 30 years later, despite a whole lot of uh, these sorts of exposés and research and people talking about it, writing about it, Asmita has also written about it, uh, we still have that narrow brand of environmentalism, uh, especially in this city and uh, people in the city who drive some, you know, like either whether it's wildlife conservation in, in the central government, the policies that are there, or it's things like uh, pollution. So a few years back, uh, there was a hue and cry about industrial pollution in Delhi. And of course, the solution was you shift all the industries out. It doesn't matter what happens to the people where they're shifted. But of course, Delhi citizens would be safe. Not that you are, because there's lots of other sources of pollution. But it's that brand which I think needs to be, which, uh, Kind of is uh, our learnings from say Chipko and Narmada and all were running counter to this brand of environmentalism. So it's a kind of a uh, you know a lot of us uh, as young people are, are sometimes confused by that. There's also, for instance, the brand of Nimbi. No, do you know Nimbi? Not in my backyard. Okay, so uh, shifting industries out of Delhi and putting them somewhere else is a Nimbi. Okay, industry is fine, but not in my backyard. Uh, that's a narrow form of NIMBY. There's also a broad form of NIMBY which actually becomes not in anyone's backyard. So it's not no longer NIMBY, it's N I whatever, A B Y. So uh, uh, unfortunately, this this first narrow sort of environmentalism still uh, is still fairly predominant and is getting actually even more stronger in recent times. And I just want to relate this to what's happening with climate. Everybody's talking about climate change these days, right? Uh, so, if you look at the solutions that people are offering to climate change, the things like carbon trading, um, technological techno fixes, uh, geoengineering, so actually changing the earth uh, in many different ways in massive operations, um, market uh, mechanisms to deal with pollution and, and uh, so on and so forth. And again, to me, this is a, this is a form of narrow environmentalism which kind of attempts to look at things from the perspective of saying, okay, technology will solve everything or the market will solve everything. What this does not do, what neither the earlier narrow brand of environmentalism that I talked about and nor this carb, uh, carbon trading and techno fixes kind of climate change environmentalism, what neither of them do is to actually interrogate the uh, fundamental roots of the crisis itself, uh, which are not in terms of bad technologies or the poor not knowing what to do, the, you know, um, illiteracy causing ecological problems, the worst environment is in the slums, etc, etc, etc. The tribals are the ones who are killing off the tigers. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a brand of solutionism which actually does not really go fundamentally into why we are in the crisis that we are. Which is about some of what Joy spoke about, which is that, you know, what, what's our model of development, who is driving it? Uh, which are the classes that are driving this model of development or castes? Uh, which, uh, you know, whether you take capitalism as a fundamental model or you take state led, uh, state dominated socialism or socialist industrialization as a model, you actually need to go into that level of analysis to actually figure out what the solutions could be um, and why some of these things that are being told to us uh, are really not. Uh, fundamental solutions. They're not long-term solutions. They're basically just tinkering around a little bit with the system and uh, uh, fooling us into thinking that yeah, we're solving the problems. And this includes odd-even numbers uh, stuff. And not that I'm against it. I think it's good, but it's kind of superficial unless you do a whole lot of other things. Um, so then, which brings us back to to Chhattisgarh um, and virtually any other part of, part of the country where struggles are going on, where uh, you know, Adivasis or peasants or fisher communities or others are actually struggling for their land rights or their forest rights or struggling just to survive, uh, very often against development. And I think a lot of us ask this question, and as students I'm sure there's also confusion, even in us there is. Um, but <coughs> what else do we do? Because we need development, right? Uh, we have to get to I don't know, American standards of living or European standards of living and how else do we do it? And if in the process some people do lose out, well, it's not good, sad, but there's nothing else to do. There's no other way to do it. Um, also called the Tina syndrome, 
Tina syndrome is there is no alternative. Um, so I think we need to question that, and that's exactly what these movements are doing. What the movements in Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand or any of these places are, are doing is to say that for us, whether you say development or anything else, it's our land, it's our forests, it's our way of living, and we're the ones who should be deciding how to go ahead, not somebody sitting in New Delhi or Basti or uh, uh, Ranchi or Raipur or wherever. And uh, what we see actually across India is that <coughs> these movements are doing two kinds of things. One is resistance, and resistance against a destructive form of development is, is uh, to me, a very important part of the solution. It could be small-scale resistances. You could be stopping a tree from being cut down unnecessarily outside your house. That's resistance. So it could be a large-scale movement stopping a big dam somewhere in central India. Any such resistance, to me, uh, which is questioning why something is happening in the first place in the name of development is part of the solution. But the second thing these movements, a lot of these movements are also doing is what Joy uh, pointed to, which is the creative alternatives. Uh, saying, yes, okay, there is a water crisis, let's say. Um, how do we solve it without making a big dam somewhere which is going to displace 100,000 people? There is an energy crisis. Certainly, I mean, uh, energy access or energy security is, uh, is a crisis in many parts of India. 65 years after independence, we still have what, about 40 percent or more uh, people who don't have uh, secure energy access, I mean electrical energy access, uh, or in many cases even other energy access. Um, and how do we provide that without uh, making thermal power stations and nuclear power stations and big dams and so on. So these questions are very important. And what a lot of people are doing is to actually find solutions which are creative, constructive, and ecologically sustainable and meeting the needs of poor people. So, trying to actually put this this framework, uh, I mean this this bunch of uh, objectives together. So, let me just take another five minutes to talk about a few examples that I know of, which have inspired me, and then the kind of broad framework of alternatives that's emerging from that, and then we can have questions. Um, maybe two or three examples. One is uh, two from rural areas, one from an urban area. Uh, one is a group of Dalit women farmers, um, some of you may have heard of it, called Deccan Development Society in uh, Andhra, in, sorry, in Telangana, which uh, is about 65 to 70 villages, uh, spread across 65 to 70 villages, where these Dalit women farmers, now, I think you'd know that, as students, uh, you would definitely know that Dalit women farmers, women small farmers, means that they're triple disprivileged in Indian society, right? Uh, as women, as Dalits, and as small farmers. And uh, what in the last 30 years or so, this uh, group of this collective of Dalit women farmers has done, uh, it's a long story, I'm cutting it very short, is to take back control over, first of all, over their own agriculture. So, which means over their food system. So, not just food security, but food sovereignty, which means actually having control over seed, over water, over land, over all the resources, the inputs that are needed for. A sustainable agricultural system. They brought back into cultivation some 70 varieties of uh, traditional uh, seeds, millets, rice, and uh, pulses, and so on. And uh, uh, they uh, set up grain banks in in many of these villages so that poor families who are poor farmers who did not have access to adequate grains to sow could take it free from this grain bank. And then the only condition was that next year, if you have a good harvest, you would give double back into the bank. So the bank would kind of keep uh, running. They also linked it up to a parallel public distribution system. Has anybody here actually ever shopped in a ration shop? Yes. One at the back. Okay. Okay. Five. Four. Our generation at least. The senior. Senior citizens. Okay, but at least you know what they are, right? Uh, do you? Do you, anybody from? Has anybody seen a ration shop? <laughs> okay, great. There's more to see. So you know that ration shops are supposed to be places where poor people, not people like us, uh, are supposed to have access to uh, cheap food grains and, and kerosene and things like that. As we know, uh, the ration shop system in the country uh, is you know it stinks, as in like it's uh, extremely corrupt. Very often the poorest families don't get what they're supposed to get there. Uh, food grains are extremely bad quality and things like that. What they did, what these women have done is to actually set up a parallel system. 
in which the locally grown food grains, especially jowar, I think, is put, and so poor families in those villages have access to healthy organic. I forgot to mention all their production is organic, uh, healthy organic, local, cheap food. So they don't actually have to go to the government ration shop at least for that. They also have set up a organic farming, uh, organic food restaurant in the nearby town of Zahirabad, etc., etc. So that's all the agricultural stuff. And if you look at it, there's some very interesting independent studies on the nutritional status of children and women in that in those communities and how it's kind of significantly improved after they did this uh, agricultural uh, uh, transformation. But going beyond that, and this is where it's really crucial to go, is to link to, to link environment with other aspects is that they have also now, because the women have got so empowered through this whole process, that they uh, have also uh, started making their own films. They run a community radio, which goes out to 150 or 200 villages, where a lot of these programs are actually put out. They run their own small school, um, and many other things. I mean, they're like sort of, it's so, it's an attempt at a more holistic transformation of what was otherwise an extremely marginalized, exploited, set of people, Dalit women and small farmers. And uh, the social transformation also that's kind of taken place there in terms of their own status as women and Dalits is also quite remarkable and really worth, worth looking at. The second example <coughs> quickly also from rural India is, uh, uh, is a place called Mendhalekha in central India, uh, heartland of Naxalite India in Gachiroli district in Maharashtra. Medhaleka was involved with a anti-dam struggle 30 years back and they actually were part of a large Adivasi movement uh, mobilization against two big dams, both of which were stopped. Those dams were actually never built because they were going to submerge 300 villages and a whole lot of very important uh, forest area. Uh, so those were not built but in the process of being part of that movement, the villages actually also, there was a lot of internal churning about how they could uh, self-organize and, and self-govern the area so that they're not getting together only to fight against an external threat but they're also organizing themselves in ways that are more equitable more sustainable and so on and these are words I'm using of course they're not their words but in their own uh, way uh, conce conceptualizing these sorts of things and so this particular village Mindaleka reformulated its Gram Sabha which is all the residents of the village including the, uh, the children also and said that any decision that is to be taken in the village can only be taken by the entire Gram Sabha. No chief, no headman, no sarpanch, nothing. The entire Gram Sabha has to sit together and, and take that decision by consensus. Which means that sometimes their meetings can actually go on for a few days. Because if even one person is dissenting, they will not try and force the decision on that person. So, uh, through that kind of thing, they also then they also declared that in their village of 2000 hectares, the only people to take decisions would be themselves. Even if there's a government department which has jurisdiction, let's say, over the forest or the water, they could not take a decision without actually seeking permission from the Gram Sabha and the Gram Sabha discussing it and saying yes or no. Um, through that, over the last 30 years, they've actually claimed complete self-governance and self-determination uh, for that area. And they've also uh, protected their forest, mm -hmm. about 1,800 hectares of forest. They have recently got full rights to it under this new legislation called the Forest Rights Act. I still say new because even though it's about 10 years old, it's still hardly implemented. So it's kind of relatively new in that sense. But it's a very interesting legislation which gives communities full rights back to their forest. Rights of governance, rights of use, etc. So they claim that. And uh, three year, uh, two years back, they also converted all their private agricultural land into the village commons. So there's no private land anymore in that village. Um, they have then been harvesting bamboo from the forest, which earlier used to be taken away by a paper mill. Uh, they do their own sustainable harvesting and, uh, through, and through that and other means, they're actually earning income, which goes into a village fund. They now have three crore rupees in that village fund. That village fund is used for 100% employment, 100% energy security, 100% water security and creating new kinds of uh, skills amongst the youth, especially for instance, things like barefoot engineering computers and so on, which uh, would help the village in doing whatever it wants to do. And if some of the youth want to actually move out and do something for a period, then also helps with that. Um, 
the key principle that uh, I that many of us have learned from that this particular example and many others like this is the principle of direct democracy, and I'll speak about that that in a minute, where people are essentially saying that we are the ones taking decisions, not anybody else for us, at least for our area. The third example quickly is from a city which is uh, from Pune actually where I live, uh, which is uh, a union and a cooperative of waste picker women uh, called KKPKP and uh, Swatch. Swatch is the, uh, the cooperative. And over the last 15 years or so, about 2,000 or 3,000 uh, waste picker women who, again, just like the Dalit women farmers in Andhra Pradesh, in Telangana, these are also socially ostracized very bad social conditions, very bad economic conditions, many of them Dalits, etc. Uh, have uh, transformed their situation by unionizing and collectivizing and through a collective actually negotiating with the civic administration and with households much better pay for what they are doing. Segregation of the waste so that they are not handling hazardous waste, uh, but they are handling it as little as possible. And even actually now beginning to pressurize companies who produce either hazardous or unrecyclable waste, such as you know lace chips, uh, those those packets cannot be recycled. Um, so these women are actually beginning to challenge the company, saying, "Why are you producing such uh, products or, or such packaging uh, or um, uh, sanitary napkins, which they, they don't want to handle uh, for obvious reasons?" So you know, how about changing the technologies of that, they're, they're challenging uh, Procter and & Gamble and others. So, they're actually trying to see how do you, it's not just about earning more money from waste, it's also more fundamentally challenging the role of uh, the marginalized in decision making with regard to something as important as, as waste and of consumption, eventually also trying to begin to check, look at what sorts of consumption patterns people have which create the waste in the first place that they have handled. Um, anyway, in terms of results, uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, their economic status has significantly improved. So as their social status, all their children are going to school, which they never used to earlier. They have much better access to medical facilities um, and much better or much more equal relationships with the households that they deal with, who otherwise would <coughs> treat them as dirt earlier. So that's the three examples and there are hundreds more that one can give. Now quickly in the last two minutes to point to what kind of a sort of broad conceptual framework that we think is emerging from this. And this conceptual framework is not something that uh, any of us, Joy or I or anybody has kind of dreamt it up. It's like, it's based on discussions with a whole lot of these movements. <coughs> Which is that if we want uh, a society which does not create these sorts of crises in the first place, what would that look like? Or what, what would it be, what would be the key principles of that? And we say that there are five crucial elements or five crucial pillars of this. And there's no necessary hierarchy here. All five are equally important. Number one, ecological sustainability. Obviously, without sustaining the earth, we're not going to sustain ourselves. That's fairly clear to us. And here, I, let me stop for a minute and ask you a simple question, which kind of I've been asking for the last 20 years now. Uh, what's the most important thing in your life? What comes first to mind? Air. Air. Water. So, Joy, you've been affected. Yeah, I'm sure they knew that much before. <laughs> <I came. laughs> okay. Anything else? Air and water. Okay, air means what? The thing we breathe in. Which is? Oxygen. Air, oxygen. Oxygen. You know where most of your oxygen comes from? Trees. Algae. Go a bit further. Yes, yes, yes. Algae. Yeah. Do you know what kind of algae? The green algae. Yes, but and growing where? Yes, sir. Growing where? So on the sea surface, the plankton. Yeah. Okay. So marine algae. Uh, I think you're about the fifth or sixth person who's given me a right answer in the last 20 years. <laughs> Most people don't know this. That 70 percent of the Earth's oxygen is created by is is given to us by marine algae, small microscopic plants. Uh, so, the reason I say this is because, look, I mean, if, if for instance the seas are destroyed as increasingly we are doing and it begins to impact the uh, ability of marine algae to produce oxygen, we are all dead at some point or the other, right? So, anybody who tells us that environment, first we need to develop and then we will think about the environment. Uh, this is an interesting example. There are many others, of course, that we know of where uh, it's stupid, it's downright stupid to say that we will think about environment later on. 
and that first we have to develop. Uh, because without that, we're all dead anyway, in two minutes. <laughs> Second crucial uh, pillar is uh, economic democracy, which is to say that uh, the current system in which either market forces, which is largely big corporations, uh, or the state dominates our economic lives has to be fundamentally altered to one in which we have, we as either producers or consumers or both, have the control over the economy. Okay. Now, uh, the example I gave you of tech and development society, the Dalit women farmers, they and many others have also done something called producer companies. So the farmers now actually have their own company where they uh, make their products, brand them in a certain way, are able to actually sell them in the market in a way that they get much better produced because otherwise farmers today are committing suicide because the produce that they make and they put into the market gets them hardly any price. So it's the traders and the retailers who are making most of the money. Uh, so they actually, this is one way of actually democratizing the economy by, by uh, enabling the collectivization of producers themselves. And this is happening now across many different sectors, crafts, fisher, uh, communities, uh, peasants, etc., etc. Et um, so that's one thing, but also, of course, there's many other parts of economic democratization. It would also be, for instance, consumers like us. We go to the market, we have no idea what's in the products that we are buying. We don't know why they cost that much. Yeah, uh, bottled water, for instance. Yeah, this, is that? Kinle. Yeah, so Kinle, uh, if this bottle costs, I don't know, 10 rupees or whatever it is, they're making 50% profit on this. It doesn't cost this much. And every bottle that's made actually takes three bottles to make. Three times more water is used in making this than finally what we get. Uh, so economic democratization is also about us as consumers beginning to actually make ourselves more intelligent and start demanding that there are the things that we're actually consuming are things that are healthy for us and for the earth. Uh, I don't know how much pesticide we're consuming, what kinds of chemicals we're consuming and all the stuff that we eat. Etc. Etc. So these are all questions that arise in the economic democratization model, and also part of this would be more localization. Today we're in a world of globalization, right? We can take, we can buy virtually anything from anywhere in the world, uh, but somebody somewhere is paying that cost, not necessarily us. Somebody else somewhere is paying the cost. And uh, what these movements are saying is that economic democracy is also about actually localizing to the extent possible, at least for basic needs. Which means that my dependence on water is not from somebody 1,000 kilometers away. Or my dependence on food is not from somebody 500 kilometers away or from the US or wherever. It's within my own locality. Which could, which doesn't mean a, a small, small village or a small neighborhood community. It could be a larger sort of you know, region of 20 villages or 30 villages or 50 villages in a city or whatever. You have to define that in different ways. But essentially saying at least for basic needs, uh, we should be locally self-reliant which goes completely in the face of the current economic globalization model. Third pillar is uh, political, which is emanating from the Menthalega example, which is to say uh, they have a very nice slogan. In New Delhi and Mumbai is the government we elect, is our government. But in our village, we are the government. Mm -hmm. See the difference? Because when we think of government, we only think of state and central governments. They're saying in our village, we are the government. It's a form of direct democracy or radical democracy or deep democracy, which is turning the, the current model upside down. Because current model is, yeah, we elect somebody and then we kind of sit back and hope to hell that that person will do the right thing for us. What they're saying is, no, in day-to-day -day decision making process, we are the deciders, at least for all the area, things that concern us directly. Now, how do you expand that beyond the village or beyond the urban neighborhood? is a challenge because obviously every village and every neighborhood cannot do their own decision making in isolation of what's happening in the neighbor in the neighboring village or the neighboring uh, neighborhood or in the state or in the nation or the globe so you actually build upwards from and outwards from that local democracy model and see how do you make uh, larger structures of decision making more accountable to that grassroots unit i don't have the time to go into more detail but essentially it's really about uh, radical political democracy, that's the third pillar. The fourth one would be social justice. Because, and this is something that as environmentalists we used to ignore a lot, that you can localize, you can have a village taking its own decision make decision, 
but that could also end up in something like the Thap Panchayat, okay, or something else like that, where local inequalities, traditional or new inequalities, continue, and it's a few people who are capturing decision-making power. So the fourth crucial pillar is social justice and equality. Uh, and how you struggle for that, of course, is a part of a larger discussion. But clearly, issues of caste and gender and class and age and, and ability and so on are very important also to uh, as, a, as, a, as a pillar of that, system, of that ideal society. And the fifth and last one is culture and knowledge, in which the diversities of culture uh, become a very crucial part of living, not as divisions, but as something that we can learn from each other and, and coexist with. Uh, where knowledge becomes a part of our commons, which means everybody has access to knowledge, there's no privatization of knowledge, there's no intellectual property rights. There are no, you know, if Joy and I write an uh, uh, article or something, we should not be saying this is my idea and my article. We should be saying it's free for anybody to use because after all, after all we also got our ideas from somebody else, no, at some point in time. We may also have our own, but that's built on other people's ideas. The, the, the whole idea the whole model of a private uh, intellectual property right is just is crazy in, from that point of view. So, uh, culture and knowledge and, and the commons and diversity, that sort of, uh, that combination is a part of uh, that fifth pillar. Um, as an aside, um, anybody guess here how many languages India has? <laughs> talking about cultural diversity. How much? Come on, wide guess. Or not so wide guess. 18, 20, what? Mm -hmm. 2000 odd, including dialect. No, no, forget dialect. Something full languages. Full scale languages, no dialects. Nobody's even willing to hazard a guess. 1800. 1800, that's pretty good. Okay, 1921 census or 1931 census, I think said 1600. The 1991, 2001 censuses are down to 120 or something like that. Um, but that's not because we've lost all the rest of the 1600 languages. It's because the government of India decided census of India will only enumerate a language if it has 10,000 and more uh, speakers. So everything else is other languages. But uh, Dr. Ganesh Devi from Gujarat has recently done a People's Linguistic Survey of India where it's, he's come to a figure of 780 living languages that they have documented. Uh, it's an incredible piece of work, by the way. If anybody's interested, look at it. Linguistic, People's Linguistic Survey of India. And just one nugget of what he's brought out, which I can tell you the importance of cultural diversity. Anybody here from Himachal Pradesh? Okay. You are. Good. Which language? Uh, it's Kulvi, one form of Kulvi. Kulvi. Yeah. Okay. So I don't even, I've not even heard of the language. See? <laughs> uh, Himachal apparently has, uh, see if I remember correctly, 320 different words for snow. If you take the various languages of Himachal together. Now, uh, why is that important? And he tells us, that if we are dealing with climate change, because every word that you are you, talking about actually embeds a knowledge system. It's not just a word, there's a knowledge behind it. So he's saying that if you put all of that knowledge together, you might be able to much better deal with things like climate change, like say the glaciers receding, or there being less snow or different kinds of snow, or it's falling in different parts of the year, than if you had lost that uh, knowledge. So the loss of language, linguistic diversity, and cultural diversity associated with that is also a serious loss of knowledge which we so crucially need for dealing with a lot of the crisis. So anyway, that's a broad framework and what we're trying to do which Joy mentioned uh, and I'll end here is that examples like the ones he gave on water or Deccan Development Society or Mindaleka Village or Swatch uh, Cooperative etc. Uh, how do we network these different alternatives and initiatives so that they can strengthen each other and become more of a critical mass. We do very often manage to meet together when we are resisting something. So there are people's movements who get together to fight against something. There are people's movements right now coming together on the JNU issue or others, or the Chhattisgarh uh, violations. But uh, how do we also get together on creating a different future? 
imagining and practicing a different future for ourselves. And this becomes, I guess, uh, incredibly important for all of you because Joy and I will be gone soon. Uh, another, what, two, three decades maybe? Hey! <laughs> one, okay, sorry, four or five decades. Uh, but uh, you're all going to be here uh, much longer. So, you know, it's, it's a crucial question for us. We're, we're beginning to see the you know, more and more crisis in India and the only way to emerge out of that is to actually be searching for a network and strengthen and learn from all these different initiatives on the ground and create new ones. And also then dream and conceptualize <coughs> So that's a process that we call the Vikalp Sangam process. Uh, is there a pen? I can write out a website that we have, which uh, if ever any of you by mistake reads the morning newspaper <laughs> and gets very depressed, uh, go to this website, you'll cheer up. Because it's got now about 350, 400 stories of people doing some most incredible, remarkable things in all kinds of different fields of human endeavor. Uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are actually thousands out there, most of them not documented, not known by us. So there's a lot more work to be done on the hopeful side of things. Stop there. Thanks.